So for this unit, I would like you to be able to compare and contrast metabotropic and ionotropic receptors. Describe three ways neurotransmitters are removed from the synaptic cleft, and to be able to describe uh, or identify terms related to optogenetics. I'd also like you to be able to describe how it functions, uh, that's an important part, and how it can be harnessed to investigate the function of discrete neural circuits. I was going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to apply your knowledge about optogenetics on the exam. The neurotransmitter action on the receptor is really determined by the receptor rather than the neurotransmitter. While we typically think of glutamate as an excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA as an inhibitory neuro one, there are de developmental conditions and periods of time where GABA can actually be excitatory in nature. And that really is due to the receptor rather than the neurotransmitter. There are two main flavors of receptors in the brain, ionotropic and metabotropic. Ionotropic receptors are ion channels that can be triggered or activated either by a ligand or voltage. Metabotropic receptors, by contrast, are uh, not ion channels, uh, like the ionotropic are, and typically are a pentameric unit composed of five uh, you know, proteins that actually traverse the plasma membrane to make a pore uh, like that. Uh, metabotropic receptors, on the other hand, are typically seven protein units that uh, span or traverse the plasma membrane. And when a ligand binds to the metabotropic receptor, it goes through a conformational shift resulting in the activation of a G protein unit, which is composed of three subcomponents that would then go on to produce effects. Metabotropic receptors are slower to activate uh, because of this secondary effector system, whereas ionotropic receptors have more instantaneous action. Here you can see a representative image of an ion channel. Again, these can be triggered by changes in voltage or a ligand. The GABA-A receptor is a good example of an ion channel. In the case of GABA-A, if GABA were to bind to the GABA-A receptor, it would open its pores, sort of like a tunnel, allowing chloride ions to flow into the neuron to produce or, uh, an, a hyperpolarization. G proteins sometimes uh, open channels or they, uh, they can lead to the opening of ion channels that are surrounding it, or they may activate other chemicals to affect ion channels. In addition, the intracellular signaling cascades can produce a wide array of effects. Uh, they can lead to changes in transcription, translation of other proteins. Uh, in the case of dopamine neurons, this is typically done by a protein known by DART32, which is what Paul Greengard won the Nobel Prize for. Uh, DART32 would be sort of a sort of a, a integrator of these intracellular signaling cascades and dopamine neurons that would then go on and produce additional effects. Uh, it would be activated on, or DART32 would be by a second messenger system. So the chemical that uh, would actually be activated at the internal or intracellular side of the uh, metabotropic receptor would be the secondary messenger. And this would then amplify the effects of the G protein and may lead to changes in membrane potential uh, either hyperpolarization or depolarization, but it doesn't necessarily have to. I mean, there, there are a wide array of effects that can happen uh, following the activation of the uh, secondary messenger. Here's a representative sample from your book of a metabotropic receptor. You can see the seven uh, spanning transmembrane units there uh, being activated by a neurotransmitter, and then the three part uh, G protein or secondary messenger would be activated and it can produce a wide array of effects including direct activation of uh, surrounding ion channels which is what this cartoon is depicting. The opening or closing of postsynaptic ion channels is accomplished in different ways by two broad families of receptor proteins, ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Ionotropic receptors are multimers made up of at least four or five individual protein subunits each of which contributes to the pore of the ion channel. Ionotropic receptors contain two functional domains, 
an extracellular site that binds neurotransmitters, and a membrane-spanning domain that forms an ion channel. When a transmitter, or ligand, binds to an ionotropic receptor, the channel becomes activated and ions can flow through the channel. Ionotropic receptors generally mediate rapid postsynaptic effects. The postsynaptic potentials arise within a millisecond or two of an action potential invading the presynaptic terminal and last for only a few tens of milliseconds or less. The second family of neurotransmitter receptors are the metabotropic receptors, so-called because the eventual movement of ions through a channel depends on one or more metabolic steps. Metabotropic receptors do not have ion channels as part of their structure. Instead, they affect other channels by the activation of intermediate molecules called G-proteins. For this reason, metabotropic receptors are also called G-protein-coupled receptors. Metabotropic receptors have an extracellular domain that contains a neurotransmitter binding site and an intracellular domain that binds to G-proteins. The G-protein shown here has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha subunit binds to guanine nucleotides, either GTP or GDP. Binding of GDP allows the alpha subunit to bind to the beta and gamma subunits to form an inactive trimer. Binding of an extracellular signal activates the metabotropic receptor and causes GDP to be replaced with GTP on the alpha subunit of the G protein. When GTP binds, the G protein becomes activated and the alpha subunit dissociates from the beta-gamma complex. Following activation, both the GTP-bound alpha subunit and the free beta-gamma complex can bind to downstream effector molecules that mediate a variety of responses in the target cell. For example, the G protein may interact directly with ion channels causing the channels to open or close. Activated G proteins may also bind to other effector proteins such as enzymes that make intracellular messengers that mediate a variety of responses in the target cell. The activation of metabotropic receptors typically produces much slower responses, ranging from hundreds of milliseconds to minutes or even longer. A given transmitter may activate both ionotropic and metabotropic receptors to produce both fast and slow postsynaptic potentials at the same synapse. Neurotransmitter action is typically brief and uh, you know, can be deactivated in one of three ways. One is degradation. This would occur by enzymes. Uh, you know, one for dopamine would be the C COMT. Uh, you know, this would uh, you know lead to the breakdown or enzymatic degradation of uh, you know the neurotransmitter. Uh, you know, another example would be acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction and then uh, recycles it. Uh, nerve agents like mustard gas and sarin uh, prevent uh, this from occurring. They're acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, that would lead to excess acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, which leads to the flailing and these sorts of things if you've seen videos of nerve agent exposure or unfortunately been there. Another would be diffusion. Uh, you know, so this is very common. You know, there are those Transporters are typically flank the outside of the synapse. It's where they're typically located. And neurotransmitter can pass those still, uh, overwhelm the system. And uh, diffusion is very common and typical in many brain regions. You do see some variability. For example, with the dopamine systems that I study, you know, there are a lot more uh, transporters in the dorsal striatum of the uh, basal ganglia than there are in the frontal cortex. So you can see a lot more diffusion in the frontal cortex than in the dorsal striatum. Another uh, way of getting rid of the neurotransmitter is reuptake. This is very common and something I've already alluded to. So in the case of like, dopamine, like you know, you would have those dopamine transporters flanking the synaptic cleft, and a lot would be uptaken back into the presynaptic terminal where they can be recycled. Uh, you know, excess neurotransmitter can also bind to autoreceptors that inform the presynaptic cell about the net concentration of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft and can lead to uh, changes in release. 
Uh, you know, in the case of dopamine, that would be the dopamine D2 autoreceptor. These are also heteromers that are, or heteroreceptors that exist postsynaptically, but they also occur as autoreceptors presynaptically. And if you activate a D2 receptor, you see less dopamine being released. Interestingly, antipsychotics like haloperidol that are D2 antagonists, you typically think of these things as killing or crushing dopamine signaling in the brain. But I've seen this myself, I've done the experiment, you know, you actually see an increase in dopamine release with haloperidol on board because you're antagonizing the autoreceptor. However, you're also blocking the heteroreceptor, so there is less of the D2-mediated postsynaptic uh, response. One fun way to think about ion channels, in my opinion, is its application in the use of optogenetics. So there's a brief cartoon describing optogenetics. In the 1990s, curious scientists were wondering how certain algae were able to respond to changes in light. They found that light opens a protein gate called channel rhodopsin, allowing ions to flow through a cell wall. Neuroscientists quickly saw this as a way to possibly control and study the activity of neurons. By embedding the proteins into the surface of specific types of neurons, researchers could trigger electrical impulses with the flip of a switch. This allows you to turn on and off the neural population to see what effect that might have. The protein is embedded by infecting the cells with a custom-made virus that carries the gene for the protein. This technique, called optogenetics, is being used to figure out how new treatments for diseases like Parkinson's uh, and anxiety disorders. Finally, someone is shining light on the mysteries of the brain. So again, optogenetics uses genetic tools to insert light-sensitive ion channels into neurons. You can then stimulate the brain with light of, uh, using fiber optic cables. So you actually implant what's known as an optical uh, feral cannulae. This is a, a technique that I do in my lab. And uh, you then uh, alter the output and the intensity of the light, uh, and you can also alter the firing patterns to mimic neural activity to see what happens. Uh, so then you would actually stimulate the brain with light uh, by, uh, that would be delivered through the fiber optic cables that would lead to a release. In my case, they could create like a one millimeter uh, cone of light in the brain region of interest where I've already inserted the ion channels uh, using a viral vector. Some algae and bacteria produce light-sensitive proteins called opsins, which resemble the mammalian opsins found in light receptor cells in our eye. Channel rhodopsin responds to blue light by allowing sodium ions to enter the cell, which would lead to a depolarization. By contrast, halorhodopsin or archaeorhodopsin respond to yellow light. They also respond a little bit to green light, uh, actually quite a lot of green light, by allowing chloride ions into the cell. This would hyperpolarize it. And I think this is important to know. So haloredopsin hal would inhibit the cell uh, by allowing chloride ions to flow in and hyperpolarize, whereas channeredopsin responds to blue light, allowing sodium ions to enter the cell again, leading to depolarization. Here is an illustration from your book showing uh, channel rhodopsin or CHR2 being activated by blue light. When that happens, it allows the sodium ions to flow into the cell, leading to a burst of action potential, so depolarization. By contrast, halorhodopsin, which is actually a pump rather than an ion channel, that's why it's depicted differently, but halorhodopsin, or NPHR, would be activated by yellow or green light, leading to an influx of chloride ions into the cell, being negatively charged. This would lead to a hyperpolarization or a suppression of neural activity. I think this illustration depicts pretty nicely what we do in the lab. So, you know, first we take a Hamilton syringe that would be filled with a viral vector. You know, there, there are various viral vectors that we can use. We typically use something called an AAV, or adeno-associated viral vector. These do not produce any uh, you know, effects in humans uh, that we know of. 
So the AAV, you know, would then contain also the genetic material that would lead to the expression of channel rhodopsin or halo rhodopsin or whatever you want to put in there, really. And then there are a variety of ways that you can, uh, you know, direct that virus to a specific cell type. Cellular selectivity is an important part of the process. <clears throat> and there are various ways that you can uh, target a specific uh, neural phenotype. But uh, once the virus has uh, transfected the cellular population, we typically wait about one month to allow transcription and translation to occur and the uh, you know, uh, actual protein to be expressed in the plasma membrane. After about a month, uh, you know, and I would also say at the time of surgery, we actually also implant the optical feral cannulae, uh, which would then be connected or mated to the patch cable or fiber optic cable at the time of experimentation. Uh, you know, and then uh, you can do some mathematical calculations and determine exactly how much uh, light you will emit into the brain around the transfected neural population. 